Broadway will take you to another Nashville Mecca. Bruins is a must-see for every Nashville hopeful. For every guitar player who comes to Nashville to make their mark, many will go home empty-handed, but all can take comfort from a visit to Bruins Guitars. Once inside Bruins, you feel like you have virtually walked into the candy store of your imagination. Every guitar imaginable you'll find on the wall hanging at Bruins. What about a Les Paul? You'll find those there also. How about a Gretsch? There are several Gretsches to choose from. What about an old Fender amp? Or a Super 400 Gibson? Or for that matter, how about a flat top Gibson? Or a Tacoma? Flame, flame, flame everywhere you look. No matter what it is that your heart desires, I bet you can find it hanging on the wall at Bruins. George, you know John Southern? This is George Hello. Bruin. Good, Good to, to see, see you again. Thank you. Nice to see you, George. Uh, we've come here today and we'd like to ask you some questions about my personal favorite subject and hopefully your personal favorite subject, which is guitars. I generally am not at a loss for words to talk about guitars. I certainly do like them. Now, I started collecting guitars in 1963. In fact, I really started out more from day one with a collector's attitude than as a player. I knew a lot of the new Martin and used Martin models from a hundred feet away at a glance before I ever played the first note on a guitar. I have a brother four years younger than me who started playing before I did and back in 1963 when I started out that was sort of the tail end of the so-called folk boom. From 59 to 63 traditional acoustic music and the so-called new folk music was really a huge thing on the campuses in the north and east and also in California, not so much in the south. But I was at the University of Chicago and it was certainly a hotbed of musical activity as well as academics. Mom and Dad were only willing to buy me one guitar. What happened is that I had this addiction for guitars. I couldn't help myself. I'd be in music stores, pawn shops, secondhand stores, looking in the classified section in the newspaper, looking at school bulletin boards. And I'd find that for every one instrument that might personally interest me, I'd run across 50 to 100 marvelous deals on things I didn't want. But they sure were great deals. There was really virtually no electric guitar vintage market, there was an acoustic market. And Bloomfield, in my opinion, had a great deal to do with starting folks really to take a look at vintage electric guitars and think of them as collector's items and as being superior to new ones such that these things would start really being sought after and that people would pay for them. Uh, this is when he started playing with the Butterfield Blues Band. Because when I first met Mike, he's a strictly acoustic player. He played acoustic blues. And later, as I said, he got with the Butterfield Band, played a Fender Telecaster. Shortly after that, got a 1954 Gold Top Les Paul. And not terribly much after that, got a 1959 Sunburst Les Paul standard with the patent applied for humbucking pickups. Every time Mike switched from one type guitar to another, it seemed like 10,000 players wanted one like his. I never had seen anybody who was so influential in the market that everything he switched from one to the other, thousands of players just followed the lockstep right behind him, wanting to have one just like his. 
but he really did help create a market. His influence didn't last all that long. He burned out young. But from that period of the mid-60s, right on up to about 1968, he was a very influential player. And to this day, his recordings are classics. This is a 1957, late 57, Gretsch Penguin, which is, at least as Gretsch collectors are concerned, the holy grail of Gretsch's. This is one of the rarest, and certainly the model that brings the most money of anything that Gretsch ever made. These instruments that I call prototypes were actually made here in Nashville at my shop rather than at the Guild factory. I had my repair shop foreman make the actual physical prototypes to my specifications and then we sent them on to the Guild factory, which at that time was in Westerly, Rhode Island. I'm working on doing a refret right now. I'm just leveling the fingerboard so I can get it, end up with a, a nice flat plane from nut to approximately where it joins the body. If there's a little fall off, that's okay because usually with string tension, there's a little bit of uh, levering here. I'll take the neck off this thing, okay? And, uh, there's some sort of weird ledge that was built. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to level it out with lacquer. I also threw on a bunch of color and I'm trying to level it out so that that, that that weird ledge is not visible. You can kind of tell that the ledge was there. I'm kind of running all across and I kind of drop filled it and I'm shooting it with lacquer.